Welcome to WSKG's Public Forum on the Common Core. I'm Susan Arbetter. Get ready for what I hope will be a meaningful conversation about the future of our children. There is no doubt that the rollout of the new Common Core standards has been frustrating for parents, for students, teachers. It's caused upheaval for school administrators. School districts have scrambled for resources to help implement the core. At the same time, advocates for the Common Core believe strongly that the new standards hold promise for our children and that they will ensure that they have the critical thinking skills they need to compete in a global economy. So how do we proceed from here? Joining us to answer the public's questions about the core are three of the state's top educators. Commissioner of the New York State Department of Education, Dr. John King. Chancellor of the Board of Regents, Meryl Tisch and Board of Regents representative of the Southern Tier, Jim Tallon. Thank you all for being here. Thanks. We also welcome a live studio audience of teachers, administrators, educators, school board members, PTA members, and citizens of the Southern Tier. We wanna thank you for taking the time to come and discuss this critically important topic. For those of you at home, here's how the next hour will unfold. All of our audience members have submitted questions for consideration. Since we can't get to everybody's questions, WSKG reviewed all of them and chose those that reflect the wide scope of concerns around the Common Core. In just a moment, members of our studio audience will ask questions directly of Dr. King, Chancellor Tisch, and Regent Talon. I wanted to get things started with a, a, a simple question, and this is directed to you, Dr. King. Um, People seem concerned that you are marginalizing their criticisms by lumping them all into this group that you refer to as special interests. How would you characterize the people who are critical of the Common Core now? And has that characterization changed since October? Well, thank you, Susan, for the opportunity to be here first. Appreciate the opportunity to have this discussion. Ultimately, there are a range of concerns. Anytime you try to raise standards across 45 states, you're going to get a range of concerns. Some of the concerns, I think, reflect um, parental concerns about assessment, about changes in instruction as a result of the new standards. Uh, some of the concerns reflect teachers and administrators' concerns about the adjustment to the Common Core. Many of the concerns are related to other policy initiatives that are happening simultaneously. Uh, we are implementing a new teacher and principal evaluation system. Last year was the first year of that new system. So that came at the same time as the change to the Common Core, so that created uh, challenges. And I also think we have to acknowledge that it's a difficult fiscal climate for uh, schools and school districts, and, and that has compounded some Absolutely. of the sense of challenge. But, but you, in, in, you in particular, because you made a statement that, that uh, a lot of ink was spilled around, let's put it that way, about the uh, idea that um, these are special interests, which many people interpreted as meaning nice at New York State United Teachers. Has that characterization changed? Well, the context in which I used the phrase special interest was in reference to a meeting that was uh, disrupted by folks who came to the meeting with the intent to disrupt the meeting. And what concerned me there was that there wasn't the opportunity for constructive dialogue. And it struck me that that's not how we ought to proceed in our uh, discussion across the state about how to proceed with education. We shouldn't have yelling and epithets and all those kinds of things. That's, that's not constructive discourse. And so uh, my point in referring to special interest was to say if folks are coming to a, a public discussion merely to scream and to disrupt, uh, that's not productive, and we ought to find a more productive way to have our discourse. So you would say that then the people who are have, have concerns around the Common Core are not a narrow group? That no, and again, anytime you try to raise standards across 45 states, it'd be very surprising if there weren't concerns. And our job is to hear them out, to try to make thoughtful adjustments where we can, and also to help folks understand why we believe so strongly that the Common Core holds the promise of allowing more of our students to be college and career ready. Well, we're all gonna get the opportunity right now to hear some of those concerns. We're gonna go first to Tina Louth. Hi, Tina. Um, my name is Tina Louth. Dr. King, I feel since we know who you are, it's only fair that I introduce myself. I am the product of a New York City public education system. I am the child of two public educators. 
My husband is a public educator. I am a taxpayer and a parent of two children in the district that I live. I am also a public school librarian who, be, who will be directly affected by the new research shift in the Common Core. I have a vested interest in public education. My question stems from all the roles I play and all the hats I wear. I am a stakeholder. Governor Cuomo recently said that the transition to the Common Core standards has been problematic and may be subject to legislative changes next year. You personally have said that you are willing to work with all the stakeholders to make thoughtful adjustments, but that such changes can only be addressed through an act of legislative change. This is in the face of thousands of stakeholders who have petitioned you to make changes in how the Common Core has been implemented in New York State. My question is, at what point during all of this does John King heed what is being said, stand by his word to work with all stakeholders, and publicly advocate for necessary legislative change in how Common Core is being implement, implemented in this state? What legislative change are you looking for? Um, how we are addressing um, what we have seen is shortcomings in the Common Core. Dr. King? Well, first, I would say there's a set of things, set of adjustments that we can make, set of things we can do at the Board of Regents and the department in terms of thoughtful adjustments, and some of those we're, we're already doing. So we've asked uh, the U.S. Department of Education, for example, uh, to allow us through a waiver process to reduce testing in the middle school grades. Uh, we've, we are in the process of preparing a waiver request to the U.S. Department of Education around assessment policies for students with disabilities to allow students who are not eligible for the alternate assessment but have severe disabilities to take tests at their instructional level rather than their chronological age. Uh, we recently announced that we are reducing the testing time for state tests, although state tests are the same essentially that we've been giving for the last decade. Uh, we are looking for opportunities to reduce testing time. Uh, we've put forward a budget request to the legislature around um, funding that would allow us to reduce field testing and further reduce testing time. Uh, so there are some things that we can do at the department and we're doing them and we'll continue to listen and make adjustments as we have over the last four years since we really began this effort in 2009-10. Um, in terms of legislative change, uh, certainly there's a discussion in the legislature about assessment in the early grades for uh, kindergarten through second grade. The regents have had a long-standing position of um, believing that we should not have standardized tests in those early grades, uh, but I know there's a legislative effort uh, to put that in, into law. Um, there is a legislative effort around, uh, we hope, um, around professional development. One thing that the um, board has expressed a, a long-standing commitment to is ensuring that we invest adequate resources in professional development, and we don't make the decisions around resources the legislature and the governor do. So there are some opportunities there. Uh, certainly in some of the forums, the issue of the evaluation law comes up. Our role with respect to the evaluation law is to implement the law. Uh, there may be changes that, that folks want to advocate for with the legislature to the evaluation law, but that would have to be decided by the legislature and the governor. Thank you. Hi, Amy. Hi. My name is Amy McDonald, and I have three children from first grade to sixth grade. And I have a question about the data mining that's been associated with Common Core. If our own school cannot even release simple class lists to our PTA due to privacy laws, how is it that the federal and state governments are allowed to collect, store, and share personal and confidential information about our children on iBloom without parent notification, consent, or the option to choose not to? Why don't we ask uh, Chancellor Tisch that question? Well, obviously, we are very from the beginning of the reform, we said that we were going to help districts build a robust data system. I was out on Long Island, I think about two weeks ago, and I was talking with a mother um, of a fourth grader and a seventh grader. And she said in her district, they have created what they call a dashboard. And as a result of that dashboard, she can go home every night and see if her child completed their homework, see how the child's grades are, see how they did on standardized tests, see what the attendance record looked like. So we all know, I think, and I think we all believe in the value of data. 
it is incumbent upon us to work with districts and parents and parent groups and teachers groups and superintendents groups to, I think we're not fully explaining the issue of confidentiality and the role of Inbloom. So many people, I think, are uh, ascribing it to Inbloom a much larger role than they're actually going to have. This is really about district data being used at the district level to inform parents about their children, to inform principals about their student body, and to help instruction. And uh, we look forward to the conversation about ensuring what in Bloom's role truly is going to be. But we take it very seriously. Do you have a follow-up there? No, thank you very All much. All right, I have a follow-up then on your behalf. Um, <laughs> why, uh, you know, we know that in a perfect world, nothing would ever be lost. Um, hard drives wouldn't fall into the hands mm -hmm. of people with nefarious interests, but it happens. Mm -hmm. um, so what then? I mean, technology fails. Technology, as we know, we live in a world where technology fails, but technology also gives us the opportunity to make remarkable strides. I certainly wouldn't, I, no one can assure the perfect use of technology, but I would just submit to all of us here, I think we will do everything and we will go to everyone involved in this to assure to the best possible extent how the data is stored and used. But I would hope that as a community, the ability to advance ourselves through the use of technology to inform instruction, to inform curriculum, to give parents an opportunity to engage in their school districts as never before, I hope we could agree that this is a good advancement on behalf of our students and our families and our communities. And I would say one more thing. There are so many districts around this state, and there are 700 school districts, almost 700 school districts. Most of them collect this data already and send it to the state. The idea, the concerns around in Bloom, I believe, are that this data is going to sort of track the student through their academic life, which gives private companies the opportunity to sell them different tools directed to that student. Do you know, I would, at this point, I would ask the commissioner to address that sure. because the technical aspects of this, I think, are very important. Dr. King? Yes, yeah, so a few important things. One is data stored within Bloom can't be sold. It can't be used for marketing or research purposes. Ever. It's only Ever. It's only stored there for the purpose of providing a service to districts, the portal uh, that the chancellor described. It's important to say data stored within Bloom are also encrypted while stored within Bloom and encrypted in transfer. And one thing we know is that there are, in most districts today, multiple third-party providers providing data services, many of which do not provide encryption services. So we really see this effort as an effort to strengthen data security. Uh, and I think it's opened an important conversation across the state about what places are being used to store student data, what some of the risks are, and how we might address some of those risks. Thank you. We're going to turn now to uh, Casey, who has a question about um, classified students. Good afternoon. Two questions, but they go together. How do the Common Core standards allow for individual thinking and learning styles, in particular students who have learning disabilities and other special needs? Second question, will classified students who have been successful in inclusion settings prior to the implementation of the Common Core be forced into more restrictive settings if they are unable to comply with the Common Core standards? Great questions. Dr. King? Sure. So it's important to say that the, the question really raises a very important distinction that we should emphasize, which is the distinction between standards and curriculum. The standards lay out the knowledge and skills that students should acquire at each grade level in order to be on track for success in college and careers. But the standards don't dictate how instruction should happen. That, those decisions have to be made locally, and those decisions have to be responsive to the needs of individual students. So the emphasis has to be on differentiated instruction, right, trying to respond to the unique needs of students, whether they're in a self-contained setting or an inclusion setting. 
uh, we were at uh, a session today at Maine Endwell where teachers from Maine Endwell and um, Windsor, fourth grade teachers, are working together on curriculum materials that the state has provided as a resource. And that this is one of the questions they were grappling with. How do we build a bridge between where students are and the level of rigor of these materials? How do we support students? What scaffolds should we add? And that, that was very much part of our conversation. And as we move forward, time for that kind of professional development, I think, is critical. But the testing for the 1%, John, mm -hmm. would you just add? I mean, one of the things that's coming out of these forums is we have heard firsthand over and over again about the students in this 1%. And John, we are, why don't you explain, because it's important to this issue. Sure. So under federal law, 1% of um, students with disabilities are able to, to uh, take an alternate assessment. Uh, the question is, what about students who aren't taking the alternate assessment, but still struggle very substantially because of their disabilities. And one of the things that we're going to propose to the US Department of Education is for an additional percentage of students to allow them to take tests at their instructional level rather than their chronological age. The tension, however, is that in the civil rights community for students with disabilities, there's a real concern that you don't want to have students exposed to less um, opportunities for instruction because the assessment is different from the assessment that's available to general education students. So that's the balance we're going to have to work through with the U.S. Department of Education. What's the timeline there? When, uh, when do you think you'll hear? So we'll submit our amendment request probably by early February. And then um, if past practice is any indicator, it will be a few months of discussion with the U.S. Department but of Education. But we are going to push hard. Resolved. We are going to push really hard. We're going to move now to uh, Whitney. Hi. Good afternoon. Um, I believe that the Common Core standards have challenged my students to think more analytically, and over the course of the few months they've been in school, I've watched my fifth graders make observations about numeracy and discuss literature on an entirely new level. Um, however, I can't help but be concerned that in just another few months, these children who have stepped up and persevered through this new and rigorous curriculum will be asked to sit for hours for standardized assessment in which they will be tested on these concepts when we know as knowledgeable professional educators that they have not had in years past a solid foundation in place to achieve such mastery. My question is, is it really good practice to subject our children to assessments that we know that no matter the quality of their current instruction, they're not currently prepared for? Dr. King? I, I worry a lot about this question. And you know, all the states that are adopting the Common Core and implementing the Common Core are struggling with this. You know, in some of the states where they have not changed their assessments, the frustration for educators is that kids are being asked to take a test on old standards at the same time as teachers and parents and students are working together on the new standards. And so the dilemma for states is when do you make that transition, knowing that the first year of their transition is always going to be particularly hard, and that over time, students will be better prepared. Uh, you know, the students will be better prepared this year than they were last year and still better next year. And I think one of the things we as an education community have to um, emphasize whenever we're talking about this work is this is not a one-year project. This is a long-term effort uh, to bring our students to these new standards. And in that process, uh, we've got to balance our sense of urgency with realistic expectations about where, where students will be. I know, Regent Talon, you have thought a lot about this question. Thank you for asking the question. Uh, what you said, as is what many teachers have said to us, the Common Core makes sense to us. Uh, it is taking our students deeper. Uh, we heard some enthusiasm this morning of teachers talking, and they were being very realistic, too. Uh, here's the question. Why did we do the test the way we did the test, OK? Uh, as you understand, the federal law says you test three grades three through eight every year in English language arts and in mathematics. That's a requirement. And so the question, you asked the question, why did we test students in material that they had partially learned, right? Because in a sense, to me, and I'll speak only for myself, it wouldn't have made any sense to go back and test them in what they had learned the year before. It, it made sense to take step one in year one and then move forward. And the mistake, and, and I, we ought to take responsibility for this, others should take responsibility too, 
what happened when the scores came out is those students who were progressing got labeled failure. That word isn't in the law. It's not in our standards. And so this is year one, year two, year three. And my only uh, observation is that once we started into Common Core, I think we had to build the assessments off Common Core because it would have made no sense to me to go back and test the kids the way you used to teach them. That's, that's the layperson's answer, and, and I thank you for your question. Thank you. Thank you. What about teachers? Um, failure isn't in the APPR, but you know, the word developing, I believe, is. Well, there's, there's, four, there's four levels in the teaching. And but aren't they held to a certain level? Obviously, this has level. been more complicated because we're doing the teacher evaluation at the same time we're implementing the Common Core, the curriculum, and the testing. There's no question. It's all linked. Uh, but going forward in this, what we have said is, and, and Chancellor has said this, the Commissioner has said this, I've said this at the board meeting, we've started into doing the assessments. I think the assessment law may be written in a, in a way that's a bit too complicated, but the legislature will, will get into this uh, as it considers things in uh, 2014. But as we're going forward with the teachers, what we said is let the scores develop, don't start labeling people, don't take premature administrative actions based on one year of data, or honestly, from my point of view, even in two years of data. The, the, the students are engaged in this, the teachers have to be partners, and the parents have to be partners too, and don't underestimate how tough this is for the parents to be able uh, to look at that third grader who brings the math homework home and says, I don't know how to do it this way. But we gotta work with the parents too. Thank you. We're gonna go to Renee now. Hi, Renee. Hello, good afternoon. Um, my question is as follows. Where is the evidence that shows common standards and or a common curriculum will bring equal educational opportunities or lead to a better overall education? Um, under No Child Left Behind, we were told similar things, better opportunities for our students, better curriculum, better standards, better education. But now, 10 years later, there is no evidence presented that it worked. So how can you be so sure that the Common Core will indeed do this? Mm -hmm. It's a great question. Mm -hmm. It's a very good question, important question. So one thing that's an important distinction between the Common Core Standards effort and No Child Left Behind, No Child Left Behind didn't, didn't address standards. It basically said every state, come up with your standards, come up with your assessments, and we'll trust that that will make things better. What the Common Core is about is trying to gather the best research and knowledge about student learning and about the knowledge and skills that students need to succeed in college and careers and have that learning inform the standards that are consistent across the country. In many of our international competitors, they have a common set of standards. In fact, it's unusual that the United States does not have a common set of standards. But more important than that is how the standards were created and the, the research behind them. So in the early grades in literacy, for example, the standards emphasize vocabulary and background knowledge because we have decades of research that suggests that vocabulary and background knowledge are critical to students' long-term success as readers. We know, for example, that poor students and affluent students arrive at school very different banks of words. Uh, there was a famous Hart and Risley study that showed that poor students heard 30 million fewer words before coming to school than their more affluent peers. And so it's critically important in the Common Core that we emphasize that uh, language-rich environment in the early grades where students are building their vocabulary and their knowledge of the world. The Common Core emphasizes uh, conceptual understanding in math and problem solving in math because one of the things we know when we compare ourselves to our international competitors where we're falling behind in math, they tend to focus on fewer topics more deeply Whereas in the United States, we've historically had an approach to math that was um, you know, an inch deep and a mile wide. And what I heard today when we were talking with teachers from Windsor and Maine Edwell was about the ways in which uh, they're engaged in helping their students develop a deep conceptual understanding of math so students know why the algorithm works. They understand the, the ways in which fractions translate into proportional reasoning. So again, that's based on research about how students learn and what we know about the skills students will need when they get to college and careers. So we are very optimistic about the impact Common Core can have. Uh, the final point I would make is that I was in Massachusetts in the mid-90s when they raised their standards very dramatically. And they heard a lot of similar concerns. People said the standards were too high, the tests were too hard. Uh, but 
Uh, the state remained resolute, and educators, parents, and students working together uh, met those higher standards, and today Massachusetts is in the top of our NAEP scores, the scores that are used to compare performance across states, because of those very high standards. And so we are, again, we're very optimistic, but it's going to be a challenge to get there, and there's a lot of work to do as a state to make sure we get there. Do you have a follow-up? Again, on your behalf, I do. Um, but how, you know, we, we have tried these before, so how, how can you be so sure that this is the way to go mm -hmm. and that this is going to be successful? Mm -hmm. And at what point do you say, you know what, we goofed up, we're going to roll it back? Yeah. Um, well, I'm confident because of the, uh, the long research base and knowledge base that inform the development of the standards. I'm also confident because of the strong consensus, not just in New York, but around the country, among educators around the standards, uh, whether it's the um, AFT or NEA or the uh, superintendents across New York. There's a real commitment to seeing the standards work. Now, there may be disagreements about implementation. That's inevitable. But there is a strong sense that these standards whole tremendous promise for our students. The other reason I have confidence, to be anecdotal, is because of what I see in classrooms, uh, where students are writing more, they're reading more challenging texts, uh, they're doing more problem solving, some of the things that we've heard even just uh, in this hour. Did you want to comment? I do. I want to say more. Ma'am, I'm so sorry I missed your name. Renee. Renee. Renee, are you a teacher and a parent? or I'm a teacher. A teacher. So I want to say, just from the perspective of a teacher, but it, I'm a teacher, was a teacher, and a parent, I don't think we, we're doing ourselves a favor not to look out at what's going on around us and not to understand that the challenges of the 21st century economy require us to challenge ourselves, even though we are having uncomfortable moments all over, and even though I would be the first one to admit that the implementation of Common Core has been uneven across this state. I would say if we refuse to challenge ourselves, then our children and generations to follow will pay the price for our indecision. We're going to go now to Matt Craig, who is also a teacher. Uh, hello. Uh, my name is Matthew Craig. I'm a music teacher for Watkins Glen Central Schools. Um, and I guess my question is a little more on the personal side of things, Dr. King, and I hope you don't find it rude. Um, but the subject matter that I teach is largely, largely performance-based, and I have a hard time asking my students to do things that I wouldn't myself do with or in front of them. Um, and I'm sure that many of us have read that your own children are not enrolled in public school. Um, so I guess my question is what do you find valuable about the private school that your own children attend. Um, what would it take for them to attend private school? And um, I think you said it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's true. My kids go to a Montessori school. Uh, one of my favorite things about the school is how they're approaching the Common Core. They are doing a great job on um, having students write. Um, Research is a part of the curriculum from the earliest grades all the way through. Uh, they're very focused on math problem solving. The students take the state tests. Um, and um, I feel very good about their education, and that's the choice that I've made as a parent. But I don't think this issue about the future of education in the state should be about me or my kids. It's about all kids in the state and whether we want for all kids in the state to have access to the kinds of reading experiences that will allow them to succeed in college and careers, whether we want all kids in the state to have the opportunities to write frequently and to write with evidence from tax, whether we want all kids in the state to have the opportunity to have rich experiences in music and art, um, and how we get there. And so the work that we're doing is to make sure that there's an excellent education for every student in the state, no matter, no matter where they live, no matter their parents' income. Uh, and that's the work that we're committed to day in and day out. Thank you. If you're just tuning in, welcome. This is WSKG's Public Forum on the Common Core. I'm Susan Arbetter, along with uh, State Education Commissioner Dr. John King, Regents Chancellor Merrill Tisch, and Regent James Tallon, and a very lively audience of teachers, parents, board members, and other New Yorkers who have questions about the Common Core. We are now going to continue with the questioning, courtesy of Stephen from Binghamton. Hi, Stephen. Hi, good afternoon. 
My name is Steve McGovern. I'm a proud parent of a first grader and third grader in the Binghamton City School Districts and a proud teacher at Owego Appalachian School District and I teach seventh and eighth grade. My question is race to the top funding to districts has not covered the costs of implementing the program. What is the plan to continue race to the top program once federal aid ends? It's a great question. Um, Jim Talon. <laughs> you happen to have the state aid experts and right here. I, I chair the state aid committee of the uh, Board of Regents. First, first, for starters, New York taxpayers spend more than $50 billion a year on education. Uh, when I combine the state, $20 billion or so in state aid, the money that's raised locally, the federal money, it's actually $54, $55 billion a year. A lot of money, and we spend more money on education than most other states do in New York. So. That's the overall picture, and the legislature last year was generous, uh, about a billion dollars in new spending. Uh, they're coming up into another session, and uh, call your legislator because this is another year uh, in which I'm going to recommend as the state aid chair that we make another significant investment moving forward, even given all the concerns that we have about the economy. So first, we spend a good deal on education in New York. Uh, there were and are marginal costs associated with the testing protocols and the like. Some districts were able to take that out of existing resources, but we did this at a time when you know districts were tightening, tightening their belt is a euphemism. We're firing people, laying people off because of the national financial crisis that we all lived through in New York. I think moving forward, money started to flow last year with some growth. I think money is going to start to uh, flow again. Uh, I would be receptive uh, in proposing a state aid committee, a state aid proposal, uh, to focus in on some of the costs associated with this. But to be honest, the priority that I'm thinking about is how to support more professional development, because I think engaging the teachers, actually doing in some way engaging the parents in this, is a place that if we spent 100 or a couple of 200 million dollars on that activity, that would be very positive. So yes, there were financial stresses here, just as there were stresses uh, of doing the testing and the like. But on the other hand, recognize this is a state that even though we went through a real uh, downturn, taxpayers in New York uh, support a very significant investment in education. And I think that's the obligation that I felt back when I was in the legislature and now as a regent to be able to try to improve performance overall. Incidentally, I was a Binghamton graduate. My three sons were Binghamton graduates. We had a great start uh, this morning at uh, Binghamton High School. Do you have a follow-up? I actually, I, I have a follow-up. Um, as a, pa a taxpayer, I understand the burden of the taxpayers on the supporting our school districts, which I proudly do. Um, I recently did a, a research paper on the cost of implementing Common Core in New York State and there was a study done by about 14 school districts in the lower Hudson region, Hudson River Valley region, where they came together and they, they estimated that it's costing their districts about $5 million just to implement the program. And I understand professional development should be part of it as well. Um, as a teacher, I've been pulled out of my classroom to write both the pre and post uh, student learning objectives and you know, Five million dollars isn't chump change for right. a lot of districts. Exactly. So how do we? Well, there was about 14 districts, but but that's the only area I saw in New York State actually monetizing the cost. Well, that's a great question in itself. Will we be monetizing this? Well, there are costs associated with actually doing the testing. But there per district, uh, there are uh, districts. There are costs associated, particularly with the time that teachers have to take or should be able to take to do the professional development to do the, that. So in a sense, recognize the legislature also increased school aid by a billion dollars last year. Uh, but that's after and, decreasing it um, and, quite and a bit decreasing and a gap it, and I am by no adjustment. means uh, indicating that we all didn't go through this together, but we are coming back up out of this, and I'm familiar with the study. It's an important study, but let's look at the totality of how we're spending money, and as the legislature goes forward in the 2014-15 budget, then let's keep this as one of the items. How are we going to invest more money in the implementation of Common Core? You're going to find support from the regions, and I think you'll find support in the legislature for that. You know what? We have another qu Thank you very much. We're going to uh, go now to Terry. Thank you. Um, I'm Terry Renia, and 
I am the proud parent of a sixth grader, a seventh grader, and a twelfth grader in Binghamton High School, as long as we're on the, on the Binghamton trend here. Um, believing that this as yet fully developed rigid curriculum can meet the needs of all students and families without taking things such as poverty and special needs into consideration is bound to create an atmosphere of failure that will continue to haunt our schools, including the staffs, the administrators, the faculties, and most importantly, the students for years to come. So my question is, what is the plan for accommodating teachers, students, and families in focus schools, such as Binghamton, and school districts with varying and greater student needs, such as poverty, hunger, gang activity, higher rates of special needs, drug activity, et cetera? Sort of a related question. Mm -hmm. So thanks for the question. I, mean, I, you know, I think the great, one of the greatest challenges for our, our country and for our state is how do we ensure that all students are able to access higher standards and be prepared for success, regardless of the obstacles in their communities. And that's going to require us to do certain things on the education side, but it's also beyond education. Right? We know that there's need for access to high quality health care, there's, there's a need for access to high quality housing, um, there's a need for greater investment in early childhood education, all things for which we will continue to, to advocate. I think from a school perspective, we were at Binghamton High School this morning, and a couple things are striking. One is the incredible dedication of the staff there to try to not only create opportunity for students, but to make sure that there are opportunities that connect with every student so that the students for whom art and music are going to be the thing that keeps them excited about school, they're providing that. For students who um, need to be challenged more, the, the International Baccalaureate Program provides an opportunity to challenge them. Uh, they're thinking about roles for career and technical education that they might expand at the school. Like uh, we visit a culinary program uh, this morning. So that was very impressive. The other thing that was striking is the work that they're doing on the Common Core. We were in, a, in a, a math class where students were doing problem solving. They were getting to a deeper conceptual understanding of algebra. We talked with the math department chair about the ways they're trying to shift instruction uh, to make sure that students are getting the best possible math preparation. One of the things that's important to note about the Common Core, and I think you, you characterize it as a rigid curriculum. Just to be clear, the Common Core isn't a curriculum, it's a set of standards. The curriculum decisions are local decisions that have to be made locally and have to reflect the needs of students. Now we've got materials that we're providing as a state, but even in Binghamton or Maine Enwell or Windsor today, we heard about the ways that teachers are adapting those materials to meet the needs of their students, and that's critical. And one of the things we've, we've emphasized about the materials is they can't be viewed as a script. They're a resource. And those decisions about instruction have to be made locally. I want to add something. One of the things that I really found very um, pleasing was, I think it was last week, the federal government published the results on the NAEP scores. The NAEP scores for people in the audience, that is the national standard test that is given not every year. Um, but it kind of assesses how school districts are doing throughout the country. In the District of Columbia, which I think has a concentration of some of the most impoverished students in our nation sitting in that school district, as they started to implement Common Core before we did, along with the evaluation and along with the data systems, they are a year or so ahead of us, they showed the largest gains nationally in the country in terms of student performance. So I want to say, if we can really take hold and we can really dig in and we can get the dollars to the districts, to the professional development, to the parental engagement, I think New York is poised to really show improvement across the board for all of our students. It looks like you have a follow-up question. I, I just do quickly. My, my problem is not with the higher standards. The concern is when I'm having conversations with, with teachers in particular, I know you say it's not a script, but then when, the, when their assessments are tied necessarily, when, when everything came out at the same time, again, it's the implementation. They, they feel a lot of pressure to conform to exactly what's there. They don't feel that they have the flexibility. And as a parent, it's a little frustrating because we don't, you know, we're sort of in the middle in terms of trying to help our kids move forward. I'm all for higher standards. But there's these other social factors that need to be taken into consideration, and, and it's become a huge frustration for, this, for the, for the uh, teachers. Can I ask a question? Yeah, please. So I was wondering, when, 
We published a number of weeks ago the results on the first year of the teacher evaluation, which showed, I think, that 91% of, of our teachers were in the top two categories of performance, either effective or highly effective. Do you feel that that did anything to ameliorate the, the professional atmosphere in school buildings? Not from what I'm hearing from teachers. They're still feeling an inordinate amount of pressure. As a parent, I didn't look at them because I know the teachers and I engage myself and I know who's effective and who's not effective. But I know also that most families, or not most families, but many families don't have the luxury to have the time to do that or the resources to do that or even the knowledge base to do that. And so if we can't keep our teachers engaged in a positive way, while we have to, be, we have to recognize that they're dealing with all of these other social issues on a daily basis as well, it's just a lot of pressure. We're going to have to end this particular uh, conversation there, but we're going to move on. Hopefully, you guys can talk after the program. Hi, how are you? Jeanette. Good, thank you. Good afternoon. My daughters attend Johnson City Intermediate School, which has adopted the Common Core curriculum in ELA and math. My husband and I have found several of the books in third grade, titled um, one titled Nazarene's Secret School, um, another, The Librarian of Basra, and my fifth grade um, daughter read an article by um, Scholastic Junior titled Marriage or Else. All of these that I've cited have graphic and violent content. Do we as parents have any rights in a school that has adopted the modules to protect our daughters from texts that are inappropriate for their age and violent in nature? Commissioner King? Yes, I appreciate the question. So. Again, curriculum decisions are, are made locally, and so uh, we have a set of resources, and districts have to decide what's, what they want to use, as has always been the case. The Common Core doesn't require a particular text. I will say about those particular texts, I think The Librarian of Basra is a beautiful book. I actually went to the library with my daughters and read The Librarian of Basra. For other folks, it's a, a novel, that's one, it's a short story. Uh, children's book that's won a series of national awards for writing and is a highly recommended book for young children. It was written based on a New York Times story, a beautiful New York Times story about a librarian during, uh, during the Iraq war who wanted to protect the books in the library uh, from potential destruction from the bombing and so uh, smuggled the books out of the library because the library was being used as a government building, smuggled the books out stored them for a while in a restaurant, I think, and then brought them to her home. And it tells the story. And the, the, the story was written from this article. It's a beautiful story about the importance of libraries, the importance of books, the power of words. And it is true. It is in the context of war. Um, and you know, each district will have to decide at what level they are comfortable with the subject of war being dis discussed in school. But it is a book that has been recommended by many experts on, on early childhood literature because it's beautifully written and it doesn't emphasize uh, the war component, it really emphasizes the beauty of um, protecting these books and the value of books to society. Jeanette, did you read it? Yes, I've read all the books that I volunteer in my daughter's classroom. Um, and I guess where I struggle is no one asked us how this was going to be implemented as parents. We didn't know, well, I didn't know that it was going to be adopted and then we wouldn't have any choices as to the text. But um, yes, in the um, library in Basra, there's bombing, but there's also the people look up and comments of fear and um, I just don't see how that is beneficial. So for me, as a parent in our home, we would have discussed, my, my kids didn't have a background as I don't let them watch the news. Um, and, and as well the, as- This is third grade. This is third grade, my eighth grader. And then, so she came home and she told me about it and Nazarene's secret school, I mean, it refers to the Taliban. There's guns, the father's arms are bound and he's taken from the home. and. Um, my, my daughters have never come home talking about books. So then after, I talked to my child's teacher, mm -hmm. as well as my husband did, and then we read the books ourselves. Yeah. Meryl Tesh, can, they, can, can parents opt out? 
You know, first of all, as the commissioner said, all of these decisions about curriculum are made at the district level, and so I'm sure that this is a conversation you could be having at your school district. I would just say, you know, if I might, a similar experience. When I was in third or fourth grade, I remember being assigned to read the diary of Anne Frank, and my, my mother was a little horrified, but it was really a beautiful, um, not beautiful, it's a complicated story, but there is something, every family makes their own decisions, but I do wanna say that uh, there is growth in every choice that we make, and along the way, I think I am sure for your family, you will make the decisions that allow you to move forward, but I would urge everyone not to believe that these curricular materials that are put up as part of Engage New York haven't been thought through very carefully. And obviously, we apologize to anyone uh, for sensitivities or sensibilities, but this is life. Thank you. We're gonna go now to Mary Beth Hammond. My name is Mary Beth Hammond. I am the interim assistant superintendent at Shenango Valley Central Schools. And I also have three children of my own, one that just graduated and two that are in high school. My question is, how does the state education department project student proficiency will be if a district strictly adopts the New York State modules in English language arts or mathematics? Dr. King? Well, choice of curriculum material is only part of what goes into student outcomes, obviously. Uh, how much professional development is provided, what supports are provided, um, how much time uh, schools have. There are lots of factors that will affect student outcomes. Our expectation is that over the next few years, we will see as a result of the work on the Common Core, whether districts use our materials or materials they've developed or materials that they have um, selected, that student performance will improve over time. And we look forward to a time when, when we, rather than being in the middle of the pack in state performance, uh, we're leading the pack in state performance uh, where Massachusetts is. Uh, but that's not gonna happen overnight. That's going to take collective effort over the next few years. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Terry? Hi. Um, yesterday in the Albany Times Union, there was an article about uh, the special interest groups that are involved with the Regents Research Fund, and I would like to know if you could explain how they will not have any influence because of one of them is Gates, and he's also involved in, in, in Bloom, and they stand to make billions of dollars off our children's education. How do they not influence yours and the Board of Regents' decision making related to the Common Core? This is a good opportunity to explain how all of this works, I think. So let, let me take a crack at it. Uh, over the past several years, maybe past 10 years, Jim, you could probably speak to this better than any of us because you watch the flow of dollars more closely than anyone. The State Education Department, along with many other departments in our state because of financial realities, has been cut dramatically. Along the way, as part of a national trend, um, there was an opportunity to join in to a large reform effort. In order to partake in this large reform effort, we needed at the State Education Department to hire expertise that simply were not available to us by the regular hiring patterns that are available to the state. We went out to many foundations across uh, this country to ask them to support us because one of the things that was cut as part of the ongoing process of all of these cuts was the research arm of our department. In order to implement reform, we felt that policy making had to have a strong research component. The people who work in this fellowship, called the Regents Research Fellows, are the research, provide critical research to the department every day. The policy makers are the Board of Regents, based on recommendation that we get from key staff within the department. As for the, um, these foundations, if you look at these foundations very closely, you will see that these foundations support a myriad of other components 
to our social structure, homelessness, poverty, um, higher education, library services. These foundations are a critical arm, but certainly they do not drive policy within the department. But these Regents Fellows, the Regents Research Fellows, these are not elected officials. No, ma'am. No, they're staff. So they are th staff. they're staff, and so how does that work, Jim Talon? They, they, they work for us. Uh, they work for the commissioner. Uh, they are integrated into the staff of people who are state employees. But they're, they're paid for by the foundation. They, they are paid by the research foundation that relied on some, uh, some charitable giving. But I just want to go back to the earlier comment that we had about the budget. Uh, in January of 2012, the regents' exams, the normal old regents' exams that we've been taking forever in New York, were paid for by private charity, by a private charitable contribution by Mayor Bloomberg and some of his associates because the state budget was so broke at that point that we didn't have the money to give the regents' exams, okay? And so uh, uh, reaching out, and accepting, and I understand the criticism of, of Bill, I don't know Bill Gates, it's never occurred to me that Bill Gates gets rich or doesn't get rich out of what we do. Uh, I'm glad that he is charitable. I'm glad that a lot of the wealthy families in America are charitable. We took advantage of some of that, but what we did here was we built an expertise. The, the person who is teaching me, I'm not a teacher, so one of the research fellows uh, spend some time with me trying to help me, just as a region, understand the Common Core through the eyes of a teacher. It's expertise, it's available for us, they work for us. Uh, this is not flowing in out of state tax dollars, but on the other hand, state tax dollars are not abundant, and in the recent past, were not available at all to support the kind of work that, and support that we needed. So I think this was a uh, I, I read the article, I understand the, the concern, the statement about Gates ruling the world or something like that. That's just not the world I live in. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Heather Tavia. I teach in Downsville Central School. I teach 7th, 8th, uh, 7th 9th, and 10th grade English this year. Um, my question is in regards to the New York State 3 through 8 assessments. Um, and the availability of the information and the data that is assessed on those tests. Um, if the purpose of the assessments is to evaluate student retention of curriculum covered throughout the school year, why is the data from these assessments not made available to teachers so they can reteach the concepts that students are weakest in? Dr. We hear a lot of that question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'll tell you what is available so you have some context, not just for you, but for the audience. So, um, for all of our assessments, we have made available the criteria that are used to select the items, the criteria that are used to select every passage, all of that's transparently available. Most states it's not, but we've made that available. We publish 25% of the items from the third through eighth grade assessments with annotation, explaining what the correct answers were, which answers, uh, what the reasons were that students might have had misconceptions that would have led to the incorrect answers. Samples of student work at every grade level, uh, so that would be a resource for teachers. Regional information centers and data centers in the districts can provide teachers with item analysis, so every item, how students did and what standard that item was associated with. Uh, regional information centers can also do that for the 25% of released items, so that teachers have a good understanding student by student of how they did on those released items. The challenge around releasing more items, and some states release no items, some states uh, release items every few years. The challenge around releasing more items, the more items we release, the more field testing we have to do. And the Board of Regents has asked us to try to keep field testing to a minimum because we want to minimize student time spent on testing to the minimum necessary to inform good decision making. So the balance is if we release more items, we'll need to do more field testing. That will have a cost associated with it as well as time from students. The other challenge is that you don't want the test to become the curriculum. And one thing that we know happened, particularly before 2010, was that in many places, unfortunately, instruction was defined just by the test. So rather than the standards driving the curriculum, it was question seven on last year's test that was driving the curriculum. No one would want that. So this is the balance that, that the state has to strike. We, we have to uh, get to our last couple of questions, but I want to thank you very much.
Heather. Um, we're going to go to the Jasons. Yes, I'm Jason Andrews, superintendent of the Windsor Central School District. And as you know, our teachers are working currently on implementing the, the Common Core modules. One of the things they're struggling with the most is the time uh, factor in, in trying to, to make that uh, occur. Is there any consideration being given at the State Education Department uh, to convene uh, teachers from around the state after a year of the modules to give feedback so that they can be revised and, and edited so that it's more feasible for them to be implemented? Yeah. Short answer is yes. We're already doing that and we plan to do more. So two weeks ago we had nearly a thousand educators from around the state, um, professional development folks, principals, teachers from around the state. We had more people who wanted to be there than we had slots. We had folks for a week uh, working on the modules, talking about ways to adapt them to meet students' needs, talking about um, some of the scaffolding that they're developing in their district, sharing ideas, doing professional development with the folks who uh, authored the modules, including many New York State educators. So that's a dialogue that we want to continue and expand. And we also are encouraging the BOCES to do that regionally. Uh, obviously, I was very impressed by what you are doing with Maine and well, with your teachers having that time together, and hope that we can encourage more districts to create those kinds of opportunities and that we can get more resources to support that work. Thank you. Uh, this is our last question. And uh, we're, is this, um, hi, how are you? Hi. I'm Mary You don't Fries. look like a Jason, but that's OK. No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on the other side of the mountain from Maine and well. Um, I'm Mary Kay Fries. I'm the superintendent of Johnson City Schools. Um, I have a short question. Um, how is SED preparing to rebuild its diminished trust with the school boards, administrators, teachers, students, and parents so that no one feels that they are part of an action research project? We have to keep it real quick. Mm -hmm. Look, I, you know, having, having seen this play out in Massachusetts in the mid-90s, I, I think part of the task here is for everyone, the department, the board, uh, local school boards, local superintendents, and educators at the school level to continue to make thoughtful adjustments as we move to forward towards the goal that we all have, which is college and career readiness for our, for our students. I think uh, that's, yep, if you can do it real quickly, Jim Talon. President <laughs> Kennedy said the reason we go to the moon is, isn't because it's easy, it's because it's hard. And we're all in it together. I mean, uh, that's, I think that's the only answer to your question. Yeah, we, we, we've been listening and going around the state uh, but we're all in it together. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. We could do this for another couple hours. Obviously, we are out of time. But uh, we look forward to continuing the conversation around the Common Core with uh, people like the State Ed Commissioner, uh, Dr. John King, Regents Chancellor Merrill Tisch, and Regent James Tallon. I want to thank you all for being here today. And a big thank you to the people in our audience. Uh, they have great questions, sharp insights. I really do hope that the discussion can continue. Uh, I'm Susan Arbetter on behalf of everybody here at WSKG. Thank you again. <laughs>